want to read to you now from Isaiah, just a few verses from Isaiah 55. Well, Isaiah 55, 10. We're thinking about the word of God this morning. My, wi- my word is like the snow and the rain that come down from the sky to water the earth. They make the crops grow and provide seed for sowing and food to eat. So also will be the word that I speak. It will not fail to do what I plan for it. I will do everything I send it. It will do everything I send it to do. You will leave Babylon with joy. You will be led out of the city in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into singing and the trees will shout for joy. Cypress trees will grow where now there are briars. Metal trees will come up in place of thorns. This will be a sign that will last forever, a reminder of what I, the Lord, have done. On this week, when we think coming up to Christmas, particularly about the Word of God in the Bible, it's very appropriate. We're going to study the Christmas story and we're going to find it in the Bible. You see, that's pretty obvious. But the point is, you won't find it anywhere else. And I uh, just want to think about God speaking to us through his word. Many of you have been on this Bible course, uh, which we paused for Christmas. And we'll, we start in January and are aware of the crucial nature of the Bible and reading the Bible. And what has the Bible has to say to us. The Bible is the word of God to us. Holy Spirit gets it onto the page one way or another and gets it off the page and speaks to us. That is why if I read a few verses to you from the Bible, many of you will feel spoken to, but you will feel different things speaking to you from the passage because the Holy Spirit brings it to life. That's what it means to say, this is the word of God. And when we are coming to do Christmas lessons and carols, reading the Christmas story in Luke, Matthew and John, just want to say some very basic things this morning that you all know, um, but are worth just reflecting on, especially at this time of the year. The Bible, it says in 2 Timothy 3, it says, is spirit breathed, it's God's word, and is useful for teaching. We need this if we're going to be informed. That's the first thing. You need this if you are going to be informed, because this is where it is. And it isn't anywhere else. I, just, I found this, when I was thinking about it this week, I found that it was easy to miss the point that this was where, in what, about two and a half, three and a half chapters of the Bible, you have the entire Christmas story and you have all the information that any of you knows about Christmas. It's easy to, if you had lots of Christmases like me, it's easy to get into the details, isn't it? So, what are we going to learn new about the wise men? What's significant about their gifts? What can we say about the shepherds? What can we say about Mary? What can we say about the star that we haven't said before? And in the details, it's good. Do your Bible study. Go to your home group. Meditate. Think about it. God will say something new to you. But do not let the study of the details this week um, lose for you somehow the wonder that you've got the story at all. If I... um, if you were to come round to my house, don't all come round to my house, but say you were to come round to my house, all right? And I, I've, got, I say I've got a picture on my, perhaps I haven't, but perhaps I put a picture on my computer there, nice picture of some half-timbered German house. And I start saying to you, well, you see this house, this is in, I don't know, Sunningburg, somewhere, and it was built in, um, you know, 1742, and Martin Luther was rumoured to have slept there, sort of thing. And you say, oh, that's very interesting, isn't it? Oh, we learn all that stuff about it. And I, 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 and, uh, and, and I say, because um, we went there on our holidays, oh, I didn't know you went on holiday to Germany. Oh, but I'm just telling you about the house, but I didn't know you'd been on holiday to Germany. But it's an interesting house, but I... See what I mean about the detail and the real thing? How else would you have known that I'd been on holiday to Germany? I'm assuming you knew I was on holiday to Germany. So I thought I'd tell you about this house. And, you know, all that we might learn about Christmas fresh. I encourage you to look into it. Let God speak to you from it. But do not lose the wonder of how it would be not to have this at all. It's not, well, it is given, but it's not an assumption that it's given. 
We have this word when we might not have this word. Just hold it in your hands this week and think, wow, what if I didn't know about Christmas? Anything about Christmas. About wise men and shepherds and angels. And What about if I didn't know about the incarnation? What about if I didn't know about the virgin birth? What about if I didn't know that Jesus had come? Easter wouldn't have happened and it certainly wouldn't have worked. I think it's just... You come to it again, I ask, Luke 2, Matthew. It's extraordinary, we've got it, isn't it? I want to lose that, lose it. It's interesting, you could lose the main story in the details. Hmm? Wow, what if I didn't have that? Some um, interesting accounts given by, about people who working in, um, you know, deprived areas, some of them doing youth work and speaking to children about Christmas. It is no good saying to the children, so, can anybody tell me where Jesus was born? Hoping for Bethlehem. They will say, who? What? Why? It's not they don't know the answer, but they don't understand the question. We don't know anything about this at all. It's a blank sheet of paper. Incidentally, it apparently is very exciting to tell somebody about Christmas who doesn't know anything about Christmas at all. But it makes you realise what a wonderful thing it has to have this here, isn't it? So next time you, you're in a carol service and somebody says, and there were shepherds abiding in the fields. You think, wow, it's good to know that. <laughs> what if I didn't know? And this word of this Christmas story and the prophecy and all of this, this is what informs us about what God was doing. And we need to hold on to that and let him go on speaking to us amidst our feelings and your feelings about Christmas. It's important that we have experience at Christmas, spiritual experience at Christmas, emotional experience at Christmas. It's it's important we feel things at Christmas. But they need to be tethered to the word. You remember, um, I'm too young for this, but I was going to say, do you remember airships? I don't speak any of you remember airships, do you? But, you know, it's massive, great sort of Zeppelin things, like, you know, huge, huge sort of gas sort of flying machines sort of thing, you know. We, I think we had some of them in Cornwall at one stage, but most of them were sort of in East Anglia and places that are flat and that sort of thing. Um, and you get this massive great thing here, great thing full of hydrogen, sadly, um, and it's tethered at one end to a sort of post in a field. And it's quite a good picture, I was thinking about, that in a way your feelings, my experience is what I felt this Christmas, what moved me this Christmas, a bit like the balloon, it's good. It's up there, you know. I'm singing Silent Night. The moon was shining. God spoke. That's good. That's fine. But it needs to be tethered to the word, like that's tethered to the ground. Otherwise, I finish up playing to my Christmas experiences. My favourite carol sung to my favourite tune. <laughs> my favourite reading read from my favourite version of the Bible. You know? My favourite sort of stuffing to go with a turkey sort of thing. My favourite things by which I am moved. Well, that's fine. It's a living thing. But it needs to be tethered to the word because that's what happened. And too many Christians become vague, possibly emotional, they feel something, but they're not quite sure what it is. It's not just wonderful, it is this. It's no good even for the church saying, well, like some, some places in the church want to say, what's important about Christmas is that God is with us and God loves us and God is amongst us. It's no good thinking that. No good believing that if you don't believe in the virgin birth. Because it hasn't happened. It needs to be tethered to the event. Grounded. Incarnation is a matter of breaking into the ground. Tethered. And the world generally, their balloon is just gone off into orbit. 
It's all about Father Christmas. And most recently, and most depressingly, it is about Black Friday. Can you imagine it? Who ever thought of that name? But it's not about Jesus. Why are they so happy about light? Why do they want peace and joy and all this kind of thing where there is no source? It's not much more difficult to the, different to the pre-Christian pagan period where you had a festival in the middle of the winter because it was so black and cold and miserable that you needed to cheer yourself up. We're going back to that. Who wants to be, pa- who wants to be pagan again? Anyway, so we are informed. And we need to read it or we won't be informed. Where is the information? Mm -hmm. Here. And it is authoritative. You say, well, I know it's authoritative, Alistair. It's the word of God. But it's interesting why it's authoritative, particularly in the Christmas story. Because in some ways it's autobiographical. God is speaking to us exactly about what he did. Jesus is speaking to us about what he did. Look, he said, look what I did. Look what I said. I know. I, I was, uh, many years ago, I read a book called uh, The Featherman um, by Ranulph Fiennes, which is a, which is a novel uh, about the SAS and about how after doing some very dangerous stuff in the Middle East, years ago, this is now, not now, um, uh, a group of vigilantes actually hunted down some of those SAS troops in this country to get their own back. That's the gist of it. It's, it's probably not true, but it was, that was an interesting. But what was interesting was at the beginning of it, there was a very vivid account of how it was to be in the Middle East in the SAS in the 60s. And uh, I always thought that as a very vividly written. More recently, I, I've read another book by Ranulph Fiennes about his, his uh, adventuring about across Antarctica and across the Arctic and across Mount. A great adventurer. But he also says in the introduction to his book um, that he actually was in the SAS and he was actually in the Middle East and he actually was in those battles. And I thought, well, that's why it's so vivid, isn't it? (laughs) He was there. It would sound like a novel, but he was there. He knew what he was talking about. At Christmas, you look at, um, for instance, the story of... um, the basic story of Jesus coming. God is speaking about what God does. It's authoritative. It's autobiographical. I came. I like that. We need authority in these things. And just as an aside, in this passage in Isaiah, it's interesting that he doesn't just say, he doesn't just say, I want you to hear what I did. He's saying, I want you to hear what I said. There's a real sense in in Isaiah that what God says is what God does. In fact, historically, in the Old Testament particularly, the word of God is God's action. It says here, it will come down like the rain. It's almost like the spirit. Remember in Genesis, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. It doesn't say, God let there be, said, said, let there be light, and then God made the light. To do, to say is to do. And so when the angel says you ought to marry, you will become pregnant, it is, it is an event. It's not just a prediction. When he says to uh, Joseph, you're going to have to sort of find a new role for yourself, he, he speaks about what he's got to do. When the angel choir come and speak to the shepherds, behold, in Bethlehem there's blah, 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 it's happening. To say is to do with God. That's why it says, isn't it, in... Um, Jot it down here. Um, Hebrews 4, 12. The word of God is a living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. So I am letting God speak to me about what God spoke. The angel said, God speaking to Mary, and I hear what he's saying. It's got great authority and directness. And we need authority. There is so much um, fake news these days. What God has to say to us in his word about his coming is authority. I mean, it's, like, it's more like looking at um, the tide tables than the railway timetable. You know, the railway timetable is a serving suggestion, isn't it? It may not happen at all. <laughs> it's more like looking at the, an accountant's view of 
the of, of the of the national finances rather than a politician's view of the national finances. It is authoritative. I like to read something with authority. This is what God did in coming in Christ. This is how he makes it happen. The spirit of the Lord will come upon you and the glory of the Lord will shine upon you and you will become pregnant and this baby will be called Jesus. It's there, it tells us, that's it. So that these few weeks, just read this stuff and let it come to you. It's good to read other things about Christmas. It's re- good to read um, poetry and devotional books and we're going to read carol books and all that sort of thing. Hey, it's good. But it's nothing like the real thing. Remember my, um, we used to have a terrifying thing when we were in theological college, um, which was called um, sermon class. And uh, somebody would go and you'd have to preach a sermon in the college and they'd video it. And uh, then afterwards, they'd play the video back with the lecturers and some of the students and they'd take it apart or take you apart um, as you were doing it. I remember uh, one student had been letting forth on something or other. I'm sure it was great. And the the principal of the college got his Bible there. He says something like, "Mm, where does it say that? (laughs) Uh, it's a really good idea. <laughs> Where is it, you know? We don't want the gospel according to you. We want the gospel Christ. So it has that sense of authority, and this is the real thing. And, and I, I, I just brought along St. Luke's gospel here, where you've got most of the Christmas story. I got commentaries on, on Luke, and you can read about Luke twice this size. Easy. And actually, Luke's gospel, the whole of Luke's gospel had come out in this. Leave alone Luke 2. <laughs> May as well go to the real thing. This is the text. You read the stuff. I want to read back what somebody else thought about it. Trimmed it up and all that. Just that. So be informed with a great authoritative word of God. Let him speak to you about what he was saying, what he was doing. Let him speak to you. But also let him direct you. When we read in the Old Testament what God is going to do, and what is God is good at saying, you see, it calls for response. Looking back at some of those Isaiah passages, you see, the ones we know. Isaiah 40, prepare in the wilderness a road for the Lord. I am coming, I have fought a great victory. Now you prepare for my coming. You facilitate my coming to you. I do this and I want you to respond in this way. You know? 52, break into shouts of joy. Come on, let everybody know about this sort of thing. And then leave Babylon and take the temple equipment with you. They're called to respond. If the Bible is primarily about what God does, it is secondarily about how humans respond, positively or negatively. Mary, you are going to be um, you are going to become pregnant. Prepare for this. You know, go and you know, go and see Elizabeth. Have a talk about it, sort of thing. You, you shepherds, how, how are you going to respond? Are you going to just say, "Well, that's nice. That's interesting. Sheep were inspired." No, we'll go to Bethlehem and see the baby. You know, there's some action going on here. And these wise men, okay, they were following a star. But there's only, there's only a certain amount you can get out of a star, isn't there? And they got more out of a star than Patrick Moore would have gone out of a star. They, they come in all across the world to see this king. They respond. And so, so the word here is to inform us, but also to engage us. What, what has it got it for you in this time of Christmas? What's it saying to you? If you go to something like a National Trust sort of park, you know, big estate, you get two sorts of signs. One sort of sign says, very nice sign, because it's a National Trust. Nice sign says something like, this estate is so many hundred acres. It includes, uh, it was planted out by Capability Brown in 17th It has all these different sorts of trees. The lake is the largest lake around here. And all that stuff. And you think, oh, that's very, I know, I am informed. But there is another sort of sign which says, suggested walk. This means you avoid sort of mines, but you get the best views, you know? The only point of that sort of sign is that you get out and walk. You know, that's an interesting sign. 
It shows you where the walk is. I'm informed about them. No, you walk the walk, don't you? And so that the Bible calls us to respond, we read this and it speaks to us. And what will you do? What will you do? We talk about all the people in the story responding, well, how am I going to respond to God speaking to me at this Christmas? For instance, just thinking about, um, about that response in Isaiah. Leave and take all the temple kit with you. I could say, well, this Christmas, how is God going to speak to me about flexibility in the way we do church, the way we do worship, the way I say grace at Christmas dinner? How flexible am I going to be? What about a new thing? Come on, move on. Don't do Christmas the way it was. Move, leave, take the temple kit with you. All right, be on the move and take Christmas with you sort of thing. How flexible am I going to be? That's an interesting way to respond. Or shout forth, you watchmen, and let everybody know. Well, how am I going to witness to Jesus this year? How am I going to tell somebody else about Jesus who doesn't really know anything about it at all? I may have been addressed by the word to say, well, why doesn't so-and-so know this stuff? How am I going to do this? I'm addressed by it. I'm challenged by it, you see. Or about this business about make a, make a road in the wilderness. You know, make the, make, you know, fill in the gaps, make cuttings through the mountains. What am I doing to facilitate the Lord? Well, what coming to me and speaking to me more? What is it that sta- in this Christmas that stands between me and experiencing him more? Get the road sorted out. You know, you're, ch- you're going to do something. Now, how many, don't know how many of you have um, Advent calendars, you know, when you open the little thing. Could you imagine the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, this Advent, every time you open a window, you don't get a picture, you get a forfeit. Who are you going to forgive today? What are you going to read from the Bible today? What new prayer are you going to pray? What are you going to be generous about today? It would be quite a long advent, wouldn't it? But it will be not to say, what do you see, but what would you do? And just as I think it's a very interesting thought to think, it's amazing we've got this stuff. It's also an interesting thought to say, if I read this and the Lord speaks to me, what might I get myself into this Christmas? What might be new? What might be interesting? What might, could I venture? What could he get me into? this Christmas we are informed by the word of God we read it we are engaged by it and it takes us on it says it is um it says the word of God is a lamp to my feet a light to my path this way I never thought of that before Lord let's do this this Christmas that's interesting isn't it rather than I always do the same things at Christmas finally as you know the angel says you will receive this baby. And John says, in this the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. I said that for God to speak is to do. He spoke and it happened. The angel spoke and it happened. The spirit spoke and it happened. The word of the Lord came to the prophet so and so and it happened. The prophet said, said, thus saith the Lord and it happened. The ultimate thing you can say is, I am here. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Isn't that mystical about that? The word becomes flesh. It's almost as like Jesus was saying, I'm here. That is the message. What else can I say? I came. At the end of... uh, John's gospel it says about all that has been written in the gospel it says these things have been written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God and through your faith in him you may have life it's not just written to inform you it's not just written to direct you it's written so that you might encounter Jesus himself that is a great prize isn't it that is a great prize This, this, these next few weeks, read this stuff. This is the word of God. 
Read it again and again. Let the Spirit speak to you. Let him inform you so that you are taught. Let him engage you so that you are directed. And let him encounter you so that you meet him. Again, communion. We could say a lot about communion, which is important. But at the heart of it is to meet him, isn't it?